Hi everyone and welcome back. Um, we're going to be looking at 4.3 and other bases today. So we looked at some of the ancient civilizations and the numerals that they used, right? We have our decimal system that we use, which is base 10, um, but other civilizations had other bases. So we looked at the Mayans that had uh, base 20. We looked at the Babylonians um, that were base 60. Um, if you are you know, if you've ever used a computer, which more than likely you have, or you've been on social media, or you've sent any text messages, um, you have probably used a device with a computer chip that operates with numerals other than um, base 10 or decimal numerals, right? So um, if we think back to like our numeral system, the Hindu Arabic numeral system, this is the positional values that we use when writing our numbers. So we have our units, our tens, our hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, and so on. The Babylonians had ones, and then the second number was multiplied by 60. The third number is multiplied by 3,600, and so on. Okay, So the 10 and the 60, they're called the bases. Any counting number greater than one may be used for a positional value numeration system. So it kind of follows this formula here where the first number to the right is multiplied by one, the second is multiplied by whatever the base would be, the third is multiplied by the whatever the base is squared, and so on. Okay, so for example, the positional values for a base eight system would be one, eight, eight to the second, eight to the third, eight to the fourth, etc. One thing I want you to think about is that last system we looked at, the Mayan numeration system, it was based on the number 20, but it's not really a true base 20 positional value system. Why do you think it's not? So take a second and think about that. And if you need to pause the video, that's fine. So if, you, if you'll recall, um, in the Mayan numeration system, uh, they looked at numbers vertically, but remember that um, bottom number was multiplied by one, and then the next number was multiplied by um, 18 or um, 20. And then the next one was 18 times 20. And then the next one was 18 times 20 squared. So if you look at this pattern here, right, we have this other number that we're multiplying the base by. Whereas in these instances, we're not. It's just the base to the power. Okay. Throughout history, some societies base 12, which was called the duodecimal system, right? Duo means two, and decimal is 10, two plus 10 is 12. And base 60, again, remember that was called a sexagesimal system. Um, now, even though we use base 10, the 12 and the 60 have not really gone away. Like, if you think about it, 12 and 60 come up quite a bit. Like, there's 12 inches in a foot, 12 months in a year, um, 12 items in a dozen. There's 12 numbers on a clock. Every hour is 60 minutes. Each minute is 60 seconds and so on. So those, that 12 and that 60 are still really important. Um, however, computers and other electronic devices use three numeration systems. They use what's called the binary system, which is base two, right? The prefix bi means two. Octal, like octagon, uh, is base eight. And hexadecimal system, so hexa, like hexagon, is six. Decimal is 10. Six plus 10 is 16. Um, those are the three systems that those electronic devices use. In a binary system, which is what computers use, each binary digit is zero or one, and that's known as a bit. And when you have eight bits of data grouped together, we get a byte, okay, in the octal numeration system. Let's first talk about when bases are less than 10, okay? So a place value system with base B must have B distinct symbols. That means a symbol for um, each numeral less than the base. So for example, if, a, if you were dealing with a base six system, you would have to have symbols for zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, and all the numerals are constructed from these symbols. A numeral in a base other than 10 
um, is indicated with a subscript to the right of the numeral. So this number 123 is not in our base 10 decimal system. It's actually a base 5 numeral. So let's practice converting different bases back to the base 10, which is the base we're familiar with. So here we've got base 4. That's what that 4 represents. Okay, and in base 4, remember the positional values would be 4 to the 3rd, 4 to the 2nd, 4, and then 1, right, if I was to think about that. So what we're going to do is take that number, 223 in base 4, and we're going to write it in expanded form to get our base 10 number. So I'm going to start here with this 2, okay? And if you think about it, right, this first number is in the 1s. The second number would be where the 4 is. And that third number is where the 4 squared is. So all I'm going to do is take 2 times 4 squared plus 2 times 4 to the 1st plus 3 times 1. And 2 times 4 squared gives me 32. 2 times 4 is 8, and 3 times 1 is 3. And if I add 32 plus 8 plus 3, I get 43. So 223 base 4 is actually 43 in base 10. Okay, let's try another one. Um, we have 5,124, and this time it's in base 6, and we want to convert it to base 10. So if it's in base 6, the first spot's in the 1s, the second one would be multiplied by 6, the third would be multiplied by 6 squared, and the fourth would be multiplied by 6 to the third. So all I've got here is 5 times 6 to the third plus 1 times 6 squared plus 2 times 6 plus 4 times 1. And 5 times 6 to the third is equal to 1,080. 1 squared, uh, 1 times 6 squared is 36. 2 times 6 is 12. 4 times 1 is 4. And then if I add those together, I get 1,132, and that's in base 10. Notice for base 10, we don't have to put a subscript. It's just assumed that it is 10 if you don't see a subscript there. And, and when we normally write numbers, we don't put these subscripts. That's because they are already in base 10. Okay, so now what if I have a base 10 number and I want to convert it to a different base? So I kind of have to do what I did before. If you think back to... Um, the Babylonian and the Mayans, when I had to work backwards, I needed to divide, okay? So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna divide by the highest power of the new base. So my base here is eight, okay? So when we think of our powers, right, we have eight to the third, eight, eight squared, eight to the first, and one. I need to figure out what would be the highest one that divides into 486 without going over, okay? So I know 8 goes into 486, but 8 squared is 64, and I can divide 64 into 486. 8 to the third is too high. If you divide 8 to the third into 486, um, you won't be able to do it. You'll get a number less than 1 because it doesn't divide into 486. So I'm going to take... Um, 486, and I'm going to divide by 8 squared first, okay? So 8 squared, remember, is just 64. And when I divide 64 into 486, I get 7 is the highest that 64 can go into 486. 7 times 64 um, would give me, let's see, 7 times 64 is 448, Okay, so now when I subtract these, I actually get 38. That's my remainder. So remember, this means you've got seven groups of eight squared and 38 units remaining, right? So am I finished? Well, I've got to look now and see, does the next number, since I started with eight squared, K 
can this divide into 38? Yes, it can, so you're not finished, right? So I have to divide 8 into 38. And we know 8 goes into 38 a maximum of 32 times, right? Or 4 times. 4 times 8 gives me 32. And when you subtract, you get a remainder of 6. And then we're finished. So how do we get our answer? Real easy. All you do is you just take these numbers. So it would be 7 times 64, 4 times 8, and then 6 times 1. So the number we get is just 746, and the base, remember, is 8. So I'm going to put that as a little subscript. And you can work backwards and check it. Um, so if I wanted to check this, I would do 7 times 8 squared, 4 times 8, and 6 times 1, and add it up, and it should give you um, 486. Okay, let's try one more where we convert base 10 to another base. So I've got 273, I want to convert it to base 3, right? So base 3, again, means you've got 3 to the 3rd, 3 to the 2nd, 3 to the 1st, and then 1. So I'm going to figure out which of these is the highest number that I can divide into 273 without going over. Um, now, if I take 273 and divide it by 3 to the 3rd, Okay, it goes in 10 times. We actually might be able to divide it again. So let's do 273 divided by 3 to the 4th. And it goes in 3 times. If I try anything more than 3 to the 4th, it's going to be over. So 3 to the 4th, or 81, is the number that I'm going to divide by. So I'm going to start with 81 into 273. Okay, so even though I didn't write 3 to the 4th, it's understood. Those three dots mean this goes on forever, depending on how large the number is. <laughs> and when I divide, um, uh, let's see. Oh, 3 to the 5th will actually work. Um, 3 to the 5th. So 273 divided by 3 to the 5th. Yep, it works. So 3 to the 5th, or 243, is what I'm going to divide by. All right. So 243 into 273. It goes in, as we saw, one time. And if I subtract, I get a remainder of 30. Okay. Now, remember, I started at 3 to the 5th. So if we think of it like this... Okay, I started here. So now I have to see if these numbers will go into um, 30. And I know that 3 to the 4th is 81. 81 cannot go into 30, right? It goes in 0 times, and you would get a remainder of 30. So then we try 30 again. I'm going to try 3 to the 3rd or 27. 27 into 30. We know that goes in one time, and there's a remainder of 3. Okay, now I'm going to take that remainder, right, and I'm going to try dividing my next number, 3 squared, into it, which is 9. Okay, so see here I did 3 to the 5th, 3 to the 4th, 3 to the 3rd, 3 to the 2nd. We know 9 cannot go into 3, right? So we're going to have a remainder of 3 again. So I'm going to try one more time, 3 into 3, goes one time, remainder 0. So my answer, remember, is just this number, this number, this number, this number, this number, and then that number. So it's going to be a 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and then my base is... Okay, so I have some here for you all to try, um, if you would like. It's really good practice.
The only thing I will caution you is number six. You may want to wait until I cover this next part to do um, number six there. So here we have bases greater than 10. Okay, what happens when it's greater than 10? Um, we looked at so far, um, our bases have, have been smaller than 10, like base four, base six, base eight, base three. Okay, the bases here are all smaller than 10 until you get to this one, which is why I said to wait. Okay, so remember um, that a place value system with a base whatever that base is, we'll call it B, has to have symbols for digits from zero up to one less than that base, right? So base 10 would be zero through nine. Base six is zero through five, as we saw. So what happens when it's larger than 10? We need single digit symbols to represent those numbers, 10, 11, 12, up to one less than the base. So in this textbook, whenever a base is larger than 10 is used, we're gonna use a capital letter and the capital letter we would use to represent 10 would be A. And then we're just going to go alphabetically in numerical order. So we know that A is 10, B would be 11, C would be 12, D is 13, E would be 14, and so on. Okay, so for base 10, duodecimal, um, we would need the symbol 0 through 9, and then A for 10, B for 11. Okay, so let's see how to convert. Um, in this case, we have 39BA base 12 to base 10, that the base that we're um, familiar with using. All right, so we know that since we're dealing in base 12, right, think of this A as being multiplied by one, right? B would be multiplied by 12 to the first, C, or nine by 12 squared, and 13 by 12 to the third. So we just have, uh, or three by 12 to the third. So I have three times 12 to the third plus nine times 12 squared. Okay, B is the number 11. So that's 11 times 12. And then A is the number 10. So that's 10 times one. And if I multiply this out, three times 12 to the third gives me uh, 5184, 9 times 12 squared is 1296, 11 times 12 is 132, and 10 times 1 is 10. And then if we add those up, we get 6622. So that is the base 10 version of this number in base 12. Okay, now let's go backwards. We have base 10. Already, we want to convert to another base, so remember, we're going to have to use division here, and we're going to have to divide by the largest positional value that goes into 6893. So for 12, um, remember, we've got, you know, it could be 12 to the fourth, 12 to the third, 12 to the second, 12 to the first, and then uh, one. So let's first take... Um, 68.93, and let's divide by, let me get rid of these. So 68.93, let's first divide it by 12 to the first. Okay, so we know it can go in a lot more than that. 68.93, and let's do 12 to the second. Okay, I can still divide. Uh, 12 to the second goes into that number 47 times. So let's keep going. 68.93, and then divide it by 12 to the third. Okay, so it goes in 3.9 times. It's probably not going to be divisible by 12 to the fourth, but we'll check it just in case. And like I said, we got a number smaller than one, so it's not divisible by 12 to the fourth. So we're going to we're going to divide by 12 to the third. And 12 to the 12 to the third is 1,728, okay? So I'm going to divide 68.93 by 17.28, which we can see goes in 3.989 times. So it goes in three times. Okay, so 17.28 into 68.93. 
and we said it goes in three times. Three times 1728 gives me 5184. And when I subtract that, I get 1709. That's my remainder. So I've got three groups of 12 to the third with 1,709 units remaining. So since I started with 12 to the third, remember the next one I wanna try is 12 squared and then 12, okay? So 12 squared, which is 144, can definitely go into 1709. And 144 divides into 1709 11 times. Okay, 11 times 144 gives us 1584. And then I'm gonna subtract that and I would get a remainder of 125. So the only one to check now is 12. 12 can go into 125. And 12 goes into 125 10 times. And there's a remainder of five. So now I'm finished, right? My answer is just going to be this number, this number, this number, and then my remainder. So it's gonna be three. The number 11 is B. The number 10 is A. And then the remainder is five. And remember, we wanna signify it's base 12. So we place the 12 um, as a subscript to the right of the number. And there's a couple more here for you to um, practice with and try before we move on to 4.4. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Hi all, well, in this next part of the video, we're gonna look at polynomial functions and we're gonna find the zeros and state the multiplicity and determine if the graph will cross or touch at each zero and then also look at the end behavior. So in this first problem here, we have this polynomial and um, I want to find the zeros, which remember just the x-intercepts. So I'm gonna take my expression and just set it equal to zero. And remember that we're gonna apply the zero product property, which just means take each of the factors and set it equal to zero. I don't have to worry about setting one tenth equal to zero because it doesn't, right? So we're just gonna take x minus two to the third and make it equal zero, two x minus one equals zero, and x plus two squared equals zero. And my exponents tell me my multiplicity. So here we know we're gonna have a repeated root of three. It's gonna be a multiplicity of three. That just means that the when you solve this and set it equal to zero, it has three answers that are the same. So if you solve for x here, you're gonna get two, but because of the three, there's really three twos. So x equals two, has a multiplicity of two, of three. 
And then 2x minus 1, if I solve that for x, I get 1 half. And that multiplicity is just 1. And then x plus 2, if I set that equal to 0 and solve for x, I get negative 2. And that multiplicity is 2. Okay, and again, the multiplicity comes from the exponent. Okay, so now the multiplicity also tells me whether the graph will cross or touch the x-axis at that point. So remember, if the multiplicity is odd, it's going to cross the x-axis at that point. So the two odd multiplicities would be this here, because it's 3, 3 is odd, and this here, because um, it's got a multiplicity of 1, and 1 is odd. So it's going to cross the x-axis there. So here it's going to cross at x equals 2, and here it's going to cross at x equals 1 half. And you'll see that in the graph. And then even multiplicity means that the graph is just going to touch the x-axis at that point. So it's going to touch the graph at x equals um, negative 2. So you're going to see here, if I pull up the graph, you can see here how it's crossing at 1 half and at 2, because those both had an odd multiplicity, and it's touching the x-axis at x equals negative 2. So it's kind of hitting the, the negative 2, and then it's bouncing off. And this is going to be useful when you're graphing polynomial functions, okay, in addition to finding the end behavior. So that's the, the next thing I need to do. So I found the answer. My, my zeros were 2, 1 half, and negative 2. And then it crosses um, and touches at certain points. And then letter C is the end behavior. So for n behavior, remember, I need to know two things. I need to know the leading coefficient, if it's um, positive or negative, and the degree, if it's even or odd. So my leading coefficient here, right, I would have a 1 tenth x and then a 2x and an x. So if you multiply them, you would get 2 tenths, and then it would be x to the sixth power because you have an x cubed, um, an x to the first, and an x squared. So if I add those, I get x to the sixth. So my degree is six, which is even, and my lead coefficient here, it's positive, right? We said positive two-tenths. Um, so when it is positive and even, remember that it's going to point upwards, on both sides. So think of x squared, right? It's positive and even, and it's a parabola that's concave up. So it's pointing up. So when I write my end behavior, I'm going to express it like this. I'm going to talk about the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x. So that just means on the x-axis, so if we look at the graph, if we were to go towards positive infinity on the x-axis, what is the graph doing on that end. Well, on the right side, it's pointing up. So f of x is always going to approach positive infinity. So this is going to equal positive infinity. And the limit as x approaches negative infinity just means as you are walking along the x-axis towards negative infinity, again, if you look at the graph, what's happening to the graph, it's always increasing towards positive infinity forever. So the limit here is going to also equal positive infinity. Anytime you have, um, you're talking about n behavior and it's positive and even or negative and even, you're going to get the same answer for both limits, okay? Because remember, both sides are going to be going in the same direction. It's when you have odd powers that it's going to go opposite. So you'll get two opposite answers. One will be positive infinity. The other will be negative infinity, Okay, let's try one more. So here we have f of x equals x cubed minus x squared minus 2x. So the first thing I need to do is find the zeros. So I'm just going to set this equal to 0. Okay, and this is not factored for me like letter A was. So I'm going to go ahead and factor it. And here we can factor out an x, and you're left with x squared minus x minus 2. 
And then I can also factor the inside here. So two numbers that multiply to give you negative two that add to negative one, and we get x minus two times x plus one. Okay, and I'm gonna set each of these factors equal to zero. And here, as you can see, we don't have any um, powers other than one. So for each of those, it has a multiplicity of one. One is odd, so that means it's gonna cross. So it's going to cross at x equals 1, it's going to cross at x equals 2, and it's going to cross at x equals negative 1. So here are your um, zeros, and it's going to cross in each place. So if we were to actually graph that, you'll see, so if I plug in here, I have my x cubed, um, minus x squared, minus 2x. You can see at each of those zeros or x-intercepts, the graph goes right through and crosses. Um, also take a look at the end behavior. It is going in opposite directions, right? And that makes sense because our degree is a three, it's odd. So when we're looking at end behavior, My lead coefficient here would be one, so that's positive one. And my degree is three, which is odd. So remember, positive and odd, the right side's gonna go up, the left side's gonna go down. They're gonna go in opposite directions. So here, if you go to the right on the graph, as x approaches positive infinity, f of x is also gonna approach positive infinity. It's gonna point up. And as x approaches negative infinity, as you go left on the graph, that's negative infinity. Let me make that more clear. Um, f of x is going to approach negative infinity, so they're opposite for that one. Okay, and you all can try the next problem on your own um, if you take a look at those examples from above. And in this last problem here, we have um, a function, okay? And um, again, you can try this on your own, um, looking at the examples from above. So you wanna talk about how many turning points does this have? Um, you wanna find the y-intercept algebraically. We talked about all of that in the last chapter and before. Um, find the zeros or the x-intercepts and their multiplicity, and then discuss the end behavior as well. Okay, and the only other thing I want to point out to you are what power functions are. Um, there are functions of degree n, and they're in monomial form. So mono means one, right? It's one polynomial. Okay, it's going to resemble something like this. So if you had like x squared, that's called a polyno That's called a power function. Um, negative five x cubed, one half x to the sixth. Okay, and what's important to remember is that polynomials resemble a power function when you have large values of the absolute value of x, um, specifically with n behavior. So x squared, I know it's positive and even, so the graph, remember, is going to go up on both sides. So if I was to take x squared, a power function, and let's say add on to it, like something like this. If you graph that equation, it's going to resemble the power function. So it, even though it will look slightly different, it'll go through the x-axis in different places, it's going to contain the same end behavior. It's going to uh, approach positive infinity um, as x approaches positive or negative infinity. Okay, just like this one is negative lead coefficient, and it's odd. So remember, negative and odd, it's going to point up to the left and down to the right. Okay, so even if I created another equation using that power function, like something like this, it's going to contain the same end behavior. Okay, that's it for uh, this lesson. Um, please feel free if you need to go back and review to do that. If you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me.